Denise, thank you so much for coming on the show. Tell us about how you got to become the founder, CEO, and chairman of Reltio. Hey, Clint. First of all, thank you for having me on the show. It's a real pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, to give you a little bit of uh, the background, um, so I started Reltio in 2011. And most of the things going on at uh, that point in time uh, surrounding the enterprise software space, surrounding uh, what was going on with data uh, in the enterprise technology space, uh, there was a massive opportunity that we saw at that point in time. Uh, the secular trends that we looked at in order to start Realtio, first of all, every organization that we talked to had a growing problem of data silos across their enterprise. The second thing that we saw uh, happening at the same time, the evolution of new technology and capabilities that were becoming available. So for example, uh, cloud as a capability was becoming available. Uh, big data infrastructure type of capabilities were becoming available. So that provided, uh, you know, think about it as the, the new layer of infrastructure that could be used to solve uh, this kind of a problem. And uh, the third piece was every organization wanted to move their business at a faster rate and pace, which, you know, back then and even today really means uh, all organizations embracing digital technology and capabilities as the way of doing business. And with the combination of those three things, data silos became a real impediment and that's where we saw the opportunity to bring data together, the core data that your business runs on. You know, so think about customer, product, supplier type of information that you would need to unify in order to run your business at a faster rate and pace. Uh, so that's the opportunity that we looked at. And uh, that's when we decided that we wanted to solve that problem in a new manner where it would be easier, faster, uh, better as compared to the previous generation technologies that were available uh, so that customers could get to value outcomes in a shorter time frame with the new capabilities that we would bring to life. So that's how we started with Reltio. And uh, you know, this was my first time founding a company, starting a company from scratch. Uh, you know, so I sort of inherited the role of a founder, and CEO uh, at that point in time. And uh, I've led the company since then. What did the early days look like? I mean, at what point did you start raising money? Uh, how many employees did you start with? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, when we started, um, I had worked with a couple of uh, uh, people before, um, which uh, at that point in time, I knew was a great place for me to go and you know, put a founding team together so that uh, we could have a rock solid technology team to work with. Uh, so we started with, uh, you know, three more people in the team uh, that I pulled together. And early days, uh, our focus was on really defining what is the problem that we are going to solve and how we are going to solve that problem. Um, we tried to, as a first step, to go meet the customers or the potential buyers of the technology, um, because that's that way we could get the validation for what we were doing uh, or fine tune and refine how we would solve the problem to meet their needs and meet them where they were in their journey. So with that in mind, um, we didn't raise capital till about 2014. Um, you know, most of it, uh, when I say capital, I'm talking about institutional capital. Right. There was some friends and family type of uh, capital that we raised. I put in some of my own money into the um, the starting point of the company. But um, 2014 was the first time when we raised institutional capital. And uh, that was our Series A round of financing. That was uh, late 20, uh, December of 2014. 14 and January of uh, 2015 timeframe. By that timeframe, we already had a few customers. We were generating revenue. We were, in fact, uh, generating a profit uh, at our small size and scale by that timeframe. How did 
how has technology evolved since 2011? Like, I mean, you obviously saw like, hey, here's where things are going. At that point, like moving to the cloud, if I remember right, was kind of like the big thing. That and what you just described around like data management and how do we get out of these data silos and get all of our uh, data kind of in one place and easy to manage, right? Um, now the thing is obviously artificial intelli- intelligence. And it's not like that's a new thing, but these large language models have put it into the zeitgeist where um, everyone's talking about it now. So how do you, ha- I mean, how has the technology landscape changed in just a little over a decade with you being on the front lines of that? Well, um, you know, Clint, the amazing thing is that the technology landscape, first of all, the rate and pace of evolution has been tremendous. Um, in fact, every six months we see new innovation coming to life uh, every you know every time we turn our heads uh, there's something new on the horizon that's available to us but at the same time i think some of the fundamental secular trends haven't really changed you know so for example um, there is some durability to the type of things that we bet on in 2011 for example on day 0 of starting Relative, we said that we are going to be a software as a service uh, product that will run on public cloud infrastructure. We will not do anything on-prem. We will not go into a customer's um, you know, environment. We will run this as a software as a service capability and build it on public cloud infrastructure. So that direction you know, was an early bet that we made and now we are seeing that uh, you know one of the first customers that I went and talked to, potential customers that I went and talked to in 2011, uh, right out of the gate was a large financial institution. And the response that I got from them was, never in our lifetime are we ever going to put our client data in public cloud in a SaaS solution. We have this problem. We de- do need to unify it across multiple silos of information that we have within our enterprise, but we will never do it in the cloud. Those organizations are now embracing the cloud, right? So think about it this way, that we made an early bet that is still continuing to be a durable bet for us versus the evolution that is taking place in parallel is the type of, um, I call it the layer cake of innovation where we don't have to invent everything possible all the way from uh, you know disk drives to solid state drives to networking technology no we don't have to do that we have to focus on the problem that we solve while leveraging the layer cake of innovation that sits below us and that's where the ai ml evolution is extremely relevant because that unleashes yet another building block that we can leverage to solve the problem of data silos. And that's how we are you know, looking at the capabilities that we bring to life. How much can we leverage AI and ML as a capability? Um, you know, for example, think about it as uh, built with AI. So anything and everything that we do, we are leveraging AI for it. Uh, built uh, in AI, which is, you know, any capability that we build, we are building it with the AI ML as the way to solve that problem. Uh, Not just the developer tool set that we are leveraging, but even the features that we are building are AI ML features. And since we are talking about data, we are also building for AI because some of the data that we assemble and unify from different silos becomes the starting point for AI ML algorithms to be deployed on top of. So providing that feed directly into those algorithms so that they can have the rich set of information that we are able to bring together uh, as the trusted starting point for data inside an organization is the way we are embracing these new technologies and capabilities. Has it allowed you to go much faster as a company? and develop faster and uh, with less, it should like it should for companies like yours, at least that's the promise of it, let you go faster with less. Each each one of these innovations is a way to shorten that cycle and do more with less. 
uh, you know, so if I look at it from a productivity standpoint, uh, building with AI has been a productivity boost for us, our teams. And, uh, you know, the industry averages vary, uh, you know, uh, a lot, but uh, we are at least seeing, uh, you know, roughly about a 15% boost in productivity for our teams as they are going through the development cycle. And I think over a period of time, we are going to continue to see a faster rate of evolution along those lines where it just becomes a productivity enhancing capability for our developers to work with. And not just developers, just think about the areas of our business. Um, you know, we are running a business that is uh, of decent size and scale where even our ability to do things in a shorter time frame is going to be impacted by these AI ML type of capabilities. And we are leveraging it in those business processes as well. When you think about your product and product roadmap, you're probably like any CEO where you're like thinking about your company six months, a year from now, while you're building the current product that you thought about or the current you know thing to add to the product six months ago, right? How do you decide what's the most important to add and how do you decide like how to really, and how do you manage that product roadmap maybe? Yeah. So, you know, part of it is, uh, first of all, I would say that the best way to understand the prioritization of that is by having a constant dialogue with your customers. Because, um, you know, there is a certain path that we can cover because we, are acting as the subject matter experts. We are acting as the hot leaders in the space, and we are defining and uh, you know industry leading or game changing type of capability that is going to solve the problem that has existed for a long time in a new and innovative manner. But how to round out the edges of that and make sure that it becomes something that customers can easily adopt and work with has to be informed by what the customers want to do with it and how easily they can embrace it. So that's why the constant dialogue is extremely valuable with those customers as well as partners, because those are the constituents that are informing what matters most and what should get prioritized higher. There is you know, never a dearth of things or ideas to work on, but which ones do you bring to life first, second, and third? That sequence is extremely important. What does a typical day look like for you? Yeah, just, um, I guess this is a similar question, but specific to you, how do you decide where to spend your time? So, um, you know, when I think about uh, a typical day, you know, regardless of how early we start in the morning and those kinds of things, uh, the way I divide my time is it's a combination of go-to-market and product. And, you know, thinking about the stakeholders that we serve. So for example, customers and partners inform a lot of what we need to do from a go-to-market as well as from a uh, you know, product development standpoint. Uh, so that dialogue, spending time with them is extremely important. Making sure that there is uh, time allocated for that is uh, extremely valuable. And then uh, you know, the other part of the stakeholder equation is the employees and the shareholders that we have. What are the business outcomes that we are driving to? Are we getting to those business outcomes? If not, then what is the fine tuning that we have to do in order to hit those or beat those goals uh, becomes you know, the other half of the equation. And you know, in a certain way, you know, there is no well-defined sort of like 50% is dedicated here and 30% is dedicated here. No, that's not the case. You have to modulate because not all things in a business move at the same rate and pace. So how do you make sure that a certain area which is lagging behind versus leading needs a little bit more time and attention so that you can pull it up to the same level? So that's that's how I look at my time allocation. And uh, if there are certain areas, whether it is go to market or product or you know innovation where we might be uh, sort of experiencing a state of slightly lagging behind, then I need to go dedicate my time there a little bit more. 
How do you um, how do you stay motivated after doing this for more than a decade? Like, what keeps you going personally? I think it's the passion for solving a problem, and always, you know, at at, at heart, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm always looking for innovative ways of solving a problem. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a business process type of a problem or you know scaling a business type of a problem because you know the type of business, even though it's been the same company, but where we were in let's say 2011 to 2013 type of a time frame versus where we are now and how we need to look at you know certain dimensions of the business, it's a completely different problem set to solve for and having a new set of challenges to work through is what keeps me motivated. You know, maybe maybe it's the tinkerer in me who wants to keep fiddling with figuring out what's the better way of solving the problem each and every time. Uh, and that that uh, gets me out of bed every day because there is always a new, bigger, better challenge to go after. How have you, la- where have you landed on this whole work from home, in office, debate that's kind of and no no really reality that every company is dealing with currently um particularly during and post covid where have you landed on that um let me give you a little bit of a background on you know how we evolved as a company because that will help explain some of the thought process that we have embraced so when we started in uh, 2011 um you know, as I mentioned, day zero orientation for us was that we are going to be SaaS, we are going to be built on public cloud infrastructure. The implication of even small decisions, you know, for example, the first time we had to decide on what type of email system should we use. Should we use a cloud only system or should we install a server, put it in somewhere in the office type of a decision? We said, if we want to be a SaaS company, then we have to live and breathe SaaS. Everything that we do has to be SaaS. We will never, other than the laptops that we issue to every employee, we will not have a server anywhere in the office, right? So nothing under the desk, hidden away as a machine, you know, somebody's taking care of it, none of that. That started to define a lot of the work culture that we embraced. Um, you know, which sort of led to if everything was in the cloud, we could work from anywhere. We could have a distributed team. So very early on, we were extremely distributed across different geographies. And, you know, the other part that influenced it for us was that uh, we really started by going after large enterprise organizations or businesses. Uh, which meant that a lot of these customers that we were talking to and working with were global in nature. And because of that, we had to serve them 24-7, which meant that we had to set up our capabilities in a, you know, follow the sun type of a model, uh, which meant that we couldn't be limited to one geography. So we early on had to take on sort of a, a footprint, which spanned all the way from India to Europe to US. That was the only way we could serve a 24-7 clientele. And by the time we got to COVID, you know, think about COVID hitting in 2020 and suddenly nobody can go to the office or get together. But our work didn't stop because we were running in the cloud. Everything that we had as a system was uh, you know up and running. Every everybody had their access to their laptops. They could work from anywhere. So that was already woven into the culture, and it never stopped us from our work. Or we didn't have to pivot to something different. Yes, some of the face to face interactions everybody had to get used to doing more of it through what we are doing right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, via Zoom, but. Uh, Other than that, there wasn't a big shift for us. And the conclusion that we have landed on is that we are going to be a a remote first hybrid type of a company and work culture where 
essentially the offices that we have, we use those offices to bring the teams together from time to time on a regular frequency because I think that connection is still needed. But we are not going to be going back to the paradigm of everybody has to be in the office every day type of a setup. Uh, those days are gone. And I think you know a lot of companies will sort of weave in and out of that, trying to assess if they can do it. But the reality that we have to live with is that it will be a hybrid of the two models where the frequency of bringing people together in a you know, cadence driven manner is going to be important. But at the same time, the flexibility of being able to work from anywhere where you are is what is going to take uh, sort of precedence over everything else. What have you learned, like the benefits of that are from a cultural perspective, from a hiring perspective? I mean, all of a sudden you can hire from anywhere in the world. That's, that's kind of like an obvious benefit, right? And so it expands your talent pool ex- extensively. It's crazy. And then I wonder what are the downsides to it and how do you define culture and maintain culture? I mean, you talked about it a little bit, Harry, let's, let's get, um, you know, together frequently and, you know, meet with each other and that connection being important, but on a day-to-day basis, how do you maintain the culture? Yeah. So this, uh, you know, this is not something that happens automatically. This has to be very intentional. Uh, developing the culture is an extremely important part of this fabric. And you have to invest time in making sure that there is a rhythm and a cadence that you develop for bringing not just people together in the physical sense, but even virtually. What is the rhythm for that? What are the types of updates and you know sharing that you will do with the rest of the team? And not just from a top-down perspective, but also from a bottoms-up forum, you know, that you create where you are able to get those ideas back because the water cooler conversations are no longer happening, uh, you know, by happenstance. You have to be very intentional with that. So that's what we have tried to develop and create the different types of forums that run on a particular cadence. And almost on a weekly basis, we have multiple, you know, different forums where we are meeting together, coming together as global teams, because this is not just a phenomena of, you know, if if you were in the, let's say, the Bay Area office, what happens to the team that is sitting in the North Carolina office or in the Lisbon office or in the Bangalore office? So you still need that fabric to be built and brought together. Uh, so that's something that we are driving across the organization as a very systematic, methodical thing. The other thing you know, that we have been intentional about is while this hire anywhere gives us a lot of flexibility, but you know, there is also a burden associated with that because you know, just think about, for example, if you had an employee in every state, then the payroll burden of that or in multiple global countries where you would have employees, the payroll burden of that becomes immense. So there has to be some kind of a balance between those two extremes where you can't go hire a person in each and every country. You will be spread across 240 plus countries in that case. So how do you limit it to certain locations, certain geographies where you will build a concentration because when, you know, for example, uh, next month I'm headed over to India. Yes, we have some remote workers there, but our one hub of, uh, you know, where we are bringing the team together is Bangalore. So that gives us the ability to hire locally and make sure that when we have to bring them together, it's easy and accessible. So it's not something that uh, requires a huge amount of logistics for us to put into place. So that that kind of balance is required between to operate between the two different extremes. What are your company's values and how did you come up with them starting the way that you started and being a distributed team from basically the beginning? Yeah. So for us, uh, you know, and I, I think for every company, they have to think about culture first before you go define the strategy. And it was the same thing for us. Our goal was to, you know, as I mentioned, be a SaaS company 
So building a SaaS culture, what are the things that are going to be important for that? And that's where we came up with, uh, you know, five core values that inform that culture for us. The first one being customer first, um, you know, which puts the, the, the ability to empathize with the customers, their needs, what they're trying to solve uh, at the forefront of everything that we do. Better together, and especially because we are a distributed team, uh, globally dispersed, uh, that was something that we wanted to do. And not just for that reason, but also for the, you know, as you scale and as you grow, you need to think about the cross-functional synergy that you need to build. You, you need to build strong functional capabilities, but then you need to go across functions and build strong capabilities. And then the third one uh, for us is simplify and share. And this was important to us because the problem that we were trying to solve was a complex problem of bringing data together from multiple silos you know, and the number of silos keep growing every day. How do you, in the middle of that complexity, bring something that is simple enough for the customers to use and embrace? So that became a thematic thing for us to look at and make sure that we are not complicating the problem for our customers, but we are simplifying and sharing with them how to do it in an easier manner. The fourth one for us, uh, which is very important, is this notion of own it, where every person, every individual in the organization is a leader. And they they have certain goals, they have certain you know, deliverables, and they have to be responsible for it. And in fact, you know, the role of a leader is to think beyond what has been assigned to you and think about what else can you be influencing and driving. And that's where this own it as a cultural value for us is important. And the last one, which is, you know, going back to sort of the software roots is always better than yesterday. Think about the constant cycle of innovation. If we sit static for six months, we are going to be left behind. So everything that we do, how do we make sure that we are constantly looking for the way to improve that every day? On that one, that last one, how, what do you read? How do you continually educate yourself and stay up to date on everything happening? Given that, I mean, every six months, the entire world is different from a technology perspective. So how do you continually on a daily basis keep up with all of that? Well, so, you know, again, technology is a passion for me. So, you know, keeping up to date is sort of uh, a normal part of uh, my everyday thought process. So reading any new developments in those areas or the areas of interest uh, that I have is extremely, uh, you know, uh, rewarding as an exercise <laughs> that I go through on an ongoing basis. But on top of that, uh, I think also, you know, looking for things that are not so familiar to me and trying to understand and learn some of those things. Because a lot of times when you go across those areas, you find out that there are certain patterns of similarity to the type of things that you're working on that can be informed or applied in those particular areas as well. So that's that's how I look for, you know, some sort of pattern recognition where, uh, you know, if there is something that I don't know about, uh, that's something that I can go learn because there might be some valuable things that I can pick up and learn and apply to my day-to-day -day work. What are your thoughts on the current macroeconomic environment, kind of the state the economy is on, is in, both in the United States and globally, and really just like the state of the world, all the political unrest, wars going on, elections, things like that. How much time, it's interesting, I, I say this a lot on this show, but it seems like CEOs have to think about this far more than they used to have to do it 20 years ago. How much time are you spending thinking about that stuff? Uh, I, I think... Uh... All the CEOs or every business professional over the last four years has become extremely adept uh, at uh, handling things that we don't know anything about. <laughs> you know, because every day new things are thrown at us. 
But, uh, you know, just sort of taking stock of where we are, if I look back, um, beginning of uh, 2023, we saw, um, you know, a lot of uh, slowdown in terms of uh, our enterprise buyers, you know, how they were reacting to the market conditions and situations. And everybody was trying to optimize their uh, P&L statements. And everybody was looking at cost cutting as the first step to go through. And a lot of that happened over the course of the last 12 to 18 month time frame. Uh, as I look ahead, um, I think, you know, with the interest rates being where they are, it's a great tool that provides uh, our economy, especially the US economy, a lot of flexibility to, you know, either go up or down because we are no longer at the zero percentage, uh, you know, in interest rates. Uh, so it's a, it's a good lever to have access to, uh, which gives me a little bit of comfort about uh, how the Fed will react to the economic uh, uncertainty and how they will use that as a tool to navigate through it. But at the same time, you know, with uh, the election year coming up and not just in the US, but also you know, if you look at other parts of the world, oh yeah, this is, yeah, this there's, is there's like thirty going year. on. Yeah, yeah, right. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, the geopolitical uh, type of turmoil that's going on. Uh, add that to the mix, and my read on 2024 is that it's going to be more of the same as we saw last year, where it'll be you know sort of uncertainty surrounding us, no clear visibility to whether it's going up or down from a positive or negative trends. And we will sort of have to continue to grapple through that uh, uncertainty for another uh, 12 to 18 month time frame. So that's that's my read on it. And, uh, you know, with, without any kind of a clear signal in terms of are we out of it or are we still in it? Uh, I can't thank you enough again, Manish, for coming on the show. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. So we ask every guest this question to end the interview because at CEO.com, we believe the chances one gives are just as important as the chances one takes. And I wonder when you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? Um, I think the big, uh, you know, uh, set of influence or people who gave me a chance uh, not just through my career where uh, everybody, you know, who I worked for uh, gave me the uh, encouragement to go after the next bigger, better thing. But also in this journey uh, at Relcio, you know, having started the company in 2011, all the people that enrolled on the mission and the vision that we have for Relcio, to bring all the information together as a single unified, interoperable, reusable asset for every business. Um, you know, all, all the people that are participating in that, uh, not just the, the, the people that I work with every day, but the customers, the partners, and the shareholders who are you know, giving us every signal, every opportunity to go after the market opportunity that is in front of us is the the type of thing that I am extremely encouraged by and uh, and thankful for. Finally, I, how could people get and learn more about Relto? Get in touch with you. I don't know that you want to give out your phone number or email, like. But how do people like if they they've watched this interview and said, "Hey, I want to learn more about Relto and Manish." How, what, what should they do? Uh, Relto dot com uh, is the best place to reach out to Relto as an organization. Uh, you can connect me, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, you know, I would welcome any opportunity to engage. And uh, especially if you are, you know, if you're trying to solve a data unification problem, then you know where to look for us. Uh, and if anybody's interested in, uh, you know, sharing thoughts or asking questions about my entrepreneurial journey, I'm happy to share those, uh, you know, experiences as well. So LinkedIn and Relthio.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on today's show. Thank you so much for having me on the show.